What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster come and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our panelists and participants from around the globe. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Scaling Innovations and Technology for Food Systems discussion. My name is uh, Tara Nathan. I lead MasterCard Worldwide Social Impact Business that innovates commercially sustainable digital tools to give marginalized individuals access to basic services. I will serve as your uh, moderator for this august panel. Uh, joining me today, we have uh, in the first session an all-female panel. I'd like to uh, welcome, we have uh, the Honorable Maria Juliana Ruiz, the Honorable First Lady of Colombia, Hanukkah Faber, President of the Food and Refreshments Division uh, at Unilever, Le Unilever. Uh, Dr. Purvi Mehta, the Head and Deputy Director for Agriculture for Asia of the Gates Foundation. Welcome to all of our, our panelists. There are myriad challenges with today's food systems from land use to uh, greenhouse gas emissions to food insecurity. Today, we're gonna focus on sustainability of food systems, primarily economic sustainability with the farmer at the center and how operational or other factors can drive to that sustainability. How innovations, both technological innovations, but also pricing go to market product innovations can transform food systems to improve farmer incomes and drive towards the SDG zero hunger uh, by 2030 goal and ultimately create an inclusive, efficient, sustainable and nutritious food system. I think we all recognize here that a fundamental shift is needed to create sustainable food systems. Governments must improve policies for implementing innovative solutions. Uh, Private sector companies must bring their expertise and technology to innovate solutions to food system challenges. And of course, donors need to de-risk uh, innovation. Many of these changes are underway from precision agriculture to smart logistics and integrated supply chains. Yet adoption and usage uh, of technology and these innovative approaches that can improve food security at the base of the pyramid has uh, failed to scale. 
Broad adoption and usage uh, will only happen if innovations are economically viable, especially for the farmers. And uh, one of the fundamental challenges that we want to talk about to here uh, today is the lack of an operational mechanism for collective action. Whilst I think we all have seen there are multiple thought leadership for a, uh, for thought leadership, negotiation, government policy making, we seem to lack a mechanism to coordinate the actual implementation and scaling uh, of these innovations. And that's why the World uh, Economic Forum and partners like MasterCard and those uh, gathered here today are creating country-led food innovation hubs around the world. These hubs bring together the myriad actors required to drive collective action and build sustainable food ecosystems. The hubs focus on adoption and scaling of innovation. Today, we'd like to deep dive from the various perspectives of leaders in government, civil society, private sector, and the farmer, most essentially, on what is needed to build sustainable food systems. Critically, we wanna to hear today about the gaps to collective action and how we can enable and scale ag innovations. This session has two parts. We will begin with an opening plenary, which will be available later for the public to view through the World Economic Forum website, uh, before moving to a panel where we will discuss how to take this vision to action in the second half. Uh, I have the honor uh, to moderate this panel for the opening plenary. So again, welcome to our esteemed panelists. With that, I'd like to turn to our first panelist, the Honorable Maria Juliana Ruiz. You are very well known for your work and passion driving collective action for the well being of children uh, and especially the eradication of malnutrition. Colombia is also uh, one of the first countries to initiate a food innovation hub. So, if you could, uh, I would love to hear more about the opportunities for change you see in the food systems in Colombia. What needs to be solved? How can innovation help? And how can the food innovation hubs? facilitate this transition. Sure. Thank you so much, Tara. Good morning to everybody. It's uh, truly an honor for me to be part of this panel. So uh, to answer your question, I will probably start by the roots. And is to say that agricultural activities, rural communities, local products and producers as part of the food system have become vital to Colombia's growth both in economic and social terms. And I would like to share some numbers. And an example of this is that nearly 3.3 million Colombians are employed in the agriculture and related sectors. So this for us has also become a major target and a specific place to, to work uh, with and for. And, and this also has a specific relevance because this makes the sector as the second largest employment generator in Colombia. So this is truly relevant when we speak about uh, development and sustainable development. Additionally, agricultural competitiveness is a priority for Colombia and uh, innovation takes a relevant part on it. You mentioned I've been passionate about nutrition and I truly believe that if there's a there's a, um, an aspect, uh, a, a relevant issue where innovation, where the youth can take and play a key role is uh, presenting innovative solutions to very old and traditional problems in our countries. So as a personal insight, I recognize the need to continue working from a multi-sectoral perspective on improving nutrition, especially, of course, on women and children. And uh, this is because that, for me, has been my starting point in, in the role I'm leading right now and is working on early childhood, but with a specific target. And that has been to burst all the physical capacities, cognitive capacities of the children through nutrition at the same time that nourishing them with love and caring um, to guarantee that they're gonna be able to fulfill and to achieve their goals of happy lives and productive lives in the future. 
So uh, now in the national roadmap that uh, thrive from the, from the FCC national dialogues, we identified some cross-cutting challenges, and this probably goes straight to your question, and is that uh, I'll probably mention just a few, the ones that I consider more relevant, and is that we deeply need to appropriate the approach of the human right to proper nutrition and, and do it from a differential and, and specific perspective, including territories and local capital. The second one probably would be the imperative implementation of the local public procurement law, because we have it, but we still need to implement it all over the territory, as well as a national food waste and loss policy. We, it was launched two years ago, but we still um, have a good way to work on in order to implement and, and appropriate this policy. The third one that I would mention would be the strengthening of school feeding. And this is also related to, to that concept, probably holistic concept of nourishing mind and soul of the kids. And is that we need to strengthen in that specific period of development of the human being to reassure, as I said, that they're being um, able to, to acquire all the micronutrients they need for proper development. So um, we need to, to, to continue working in that same sense in mechanisms to promote rural family and community agriculture, because uh, this is also part of a very important um, step on the whole system. And uh, another relevant issue for us would be to, to once again, from a policy perspective, implement a systems approach on that also promotes high level coordination and collaboration, which is crucial. And for me has been proving that is the, is the right way to go, to work from a multi-sectoral perspective on transformation of our food systems. We have done so through the Great Alliance for Nutrition. You have probably heard about it. That's probably one of the, of the topics I've been more passionate about. And is that this Great Alliance for Nutrition allow us to convene different sectors and the Colombian Intersectoral Commission for Food and Nutrition Security um, has been very active in this purpose as well. Uh, I would like to share something that for us has been a trigger to continue working in this, in this way as a multi-sectoral approach. And is that last year in 2020, um, in the midst of the pandemic, within the difficulties we were uh, facing, Colombia was able to report a decrease above 40% on deaths due to malnutrition or association to malnutrition for kids under five years old. This, of course, is not the goal, but for us was significant enough to, to motivate us to continue working in this, in this sense. So I, I hopefully Thank answer you. your question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for that great introduction. And I think Hanukkah, who I will turn to next, may have a lot of responses to this. I think the First Lady has clearly outlined the demand, right, on the government side and the importance of nutrition, of secure food systems in delivering um, what is sort of, you know, the basis for not only healthy youth, healthy children, but frankly, a healthy uh, workforce, as she's described, right? Um, so Hanukkah, with that, I, I'll turn it over to you, uh, the Hanukkah Faber, the president of the Fruit and Refreshments Division. Um, Obviously, Unilever has had decades of experience. Um, not only in, uh, not only are you a leader in the consumer fast-moving goods uh, industry, but frankly, really a leader in driving social change um, through business. Uh, I'm interested to understand, from your perspective, how do you see Unilever playing a key role in the innovation and in the change that is required to accomplish some of the challenges that the First Lady has outlined? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Tara. And, and uh, thanks uh, uh, to the First Lady as well. It's really impressive um, what's being achieved in Colombia, um, especially in childhood nutrition. So uh, kudos, kudos to you. Um, what do I believe Unilever and, and other private sector 
companies can do to be agents of change in the food system. Um, well, let me first say, I believe we have an absolute responsibility to help change that system because it is broken. And many of the things were mentioned before on why it's broken. Um, and I don't agree with people like Jeffrey Sachs, who recently said that foods companies should just, um, I think he said, behave, pay taxes and stick to the rules. Of course, we should do those things. Um, but the system will change faster if the private sector and companies like Unilever do more. So I think there's two things as a company um, we need to do and we do at Unilever. The, and they are public commitments and then delivering on them and collaboration. And so public commitments are really important. You need to go out and see set specific quantitative time-bound commitments on how you're gonna change the food system for the better. And we've done that as Unilever. Um, we've committed to a whole number of things. I won't mention them all, but to a billion euros in plant-based sales um, because the world needs to eat a little less meat and a bit more plants. To doubling the products we sell that have positive nutrition, including fortified products, um, which again, the first lady mentioned. We've committed to halving food waste in our operations. We've committed to reducing salt, sugar, and calories in our products. We've committed to less plastic, which is another big issue. We've committed to more nature positive production, to a deforestation free supply chain, to a living wage for everyone in our extended supply chain. And of course, we've committed to being net zero by 2039, 11 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. So we work really hard now to deliver on those things, to report progress very transparently annually. And some of these things are going great, some are going less good, so we'll need to step on those harder. Um, and we've also put a 1 billion euro climate and nature fund in place to fund some of the investments um, that are needed to deliver on those commitments. So I think that's the first thing any private sector company needs to do, because if, if we're not gonna commit and deliver on some of the things the food system desperately needs, then who will? Um, and then the second thing I think the private sector needs to do is collaborate with others in the value chain. Um, Unilever is a big foods company, but we're not gonna change the food system on our own, that's clear. So we are working very closely with farmers, with governments, with NGOs around the world. And I think that's where these um, World Economic Forum food innovation hubs are very helpful. Um, we just announced actually yesterday uh, a new um, partnership with the Farm to Market Alliance in Africa um, under the WEF Innovation Hub. Um, and the hub really helped us to get in touch with the right partners. Um, and together we're gonna explore ways for African smallholder farmers in Kenya to grow more diverse, we call it future 50 foods because the world's too focused on just a few crops, which is bad for soil and bad for nutrition. Um, so we're going to work together to see if we can both create the supply and the demand of more diverse um, crops. So that's one example, but collaboration is so important. And we are collaborating on the ground um, with farmers, with governments, with NGOs in so many places, mm -hmm. including, by the way, with the Gates Foundation. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from them today as well. Thank you so much, uh, Hanukkah. Um, it, it truly is impressive. I think some of the groundbreaking work and sort of uh, that Unilever does uh, not only as an individual company, but frankly, as a role model for other private sector actors, um, you know, seeking and um, looking inside to make a change. Uh, so thank you for your participation. Uh, I'm gonna turn to, it's my pleasure to introduce our third panelist, Dr. Purvi Mehta, the head of agriculture uh, at, for Asia at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, the Gates Foundation needs no introduction, of course, uh, Porvi, uh, and I know you've been actively uh, engaged in investing in technology and innovation for food systems uh, across Asia, especially in India. Given these decades of experience, um, what do you see currently as the gap? Uh, I think we're all talk calling for and talking about intersectoral collaboration. I think we know the problems well, right? Uh, what do you see as the gaps? And how do you see us tactically moving forward towards um, filling those gaps and addressing them? Thanks very much, uh, Tara. And I really, really appreciated the earlier comments, uh, of course, from the Honorable uh, 
first lady and also from uh, from hanika i think uh, you know they've they've covered uh, quite a lot of things on what is happening um purely from a developing country perspective i think one of the biggest gap is we have not harnessed the potential enough um you see predominantly it continues to remain a low input low output system and i think any innovations any collaborations any transformative ideas that that sort of contributes to turning that low input low output agriculture system to more sustainable input and profitable output uh, system is going to be very very important and when i say profitable output it is not just the question of the price the farmer for example or the producer realizes out of that produce but at the same time also as as the first lady said you know optimizing the value of the produced food also to bridge the huge nutrition gaps i think uh, you know we as a world uh, have come a long way in in achieving food security the next step is to really uh, you know uh, think about nutrition security uh, in the context of the of the consumers uh, um, as uh, as hanika mentioned and as as the first lady mentioned as well i think one of the also very important aspects would be food security for the food securers uh, world over especially in developing countries the 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 largest number of malnutrient people uh, also happen to be farmers or the rural population right and so how do we link uh, agriculture production with the with its largest output which is uh, which is also nutrition is going to be very important and more and more in developing countries i think there are two very peculiar things number one is the dependence on locally grown locally sourced food I, so so that's where it plays a very very important role and number two is a re real need and as you as you've mentioned uh, uh, tara in in terms of the missing ones i think the real need is also to diversify our agriculture systems right um, uh, uh, world over and especially developing countries predominantly there are 8 to 10 commodities where our investments our efforts have been the highest which is which is usually around staple crops and staple food um, how do you diversify that to to sort of enlarge our portfolio is going to be very important and while doing so i don't think there is a trade off between either you grow nutritious food or you grow uh, you, you have more profitability i think nutrition and profitability for the farmer uh, must go hand in hand to make our uh, foods uh, or food system more accessible and affordable uh, for the farmers i think uh, the the food system hub for example or the food innovation hub plays a very very important role in sort of decentralizing the risk that the farmer faces right now uh, and and also bringing in nuances in the way the systems have been operating right the system which has been predominantly production driven system what we produce is not just uh, important how that produce reaches to the consumer uh, you know so excess affordability and also absorption uh, is going to be very very uh, important there thanks thanks so much um i'm just checking on time i think we're doing good on time so i'd love to take it back maybe and ask a question uh, to all the panelists i think there's been a couple of really important themes that have been brought up here. One is in this drive for uh, sustainability and, and sort of uh, uh, modernizing or, or changing the food systems. It's about how do we get the farmer at the center? How do we drive profitability? And how do we drive, um, well, economic viability essentially for that farmer at the center? So I would love to sort of hear from uh, from from anyone, uh, but maybe uh, Hanukkah, we can start with you, and then maybe uh, Dr. Mehta would be interested to hear what are the challenges for driving or for accomplishing that economic sustainability today. I think we talk a lot about commercial sustainability. We talk a lot about profitability, 
What are the challenges to getting there uh, from a private sector perspective? And then from a donor perspective, what are the challenges on de-risking that? Monica? Yeah. It's a great question. And one that um, is very top of mind for us right now, because we, indeed, you know, we, we, we source all kinds of things, tomatoes and onions and tea and um, soybeans and many more things. We source them in many places around the world. And we'd love to get to, um, I think Dr. Kali Baltanel calls it nature positive production on all of those, where the way it is farmed by our farmers actually improves the soil, improves the water, is CO2 neutral, and all of that isn't happening today. So how do you get there? Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all, um, but I'll give you one example where, where it, it all co has come together pretty nicely for us. Um, it's our sourcing of tomatoes in India. Um, so in India, we sell knorr, tomato soup, and kisan, ketchup, so we need a lot of tomatoes. Um, until about 2017, um, we were struggling with the quality of tomatoes. Um, we couldn't really get great tomatoes year-round. Um, monsoon season, the tomatoes were bad. Farmers were struggling with yield and living incomes. Um, so it just wasn't a great way um, for us, for the farmers, and honestly for consumers um, to get their tomatoes and ketchup and soup. So we kicked off a collaboration with a cooperative called Sayadri Farms in Western India. Um, who they, they are a cooperative of about 10,000 tomato farmers. And we did a couple of things. We actually um, put a processing plant at their cooperative headquarters so that the um, distance to our production site was massively reduced. We helped them with sustainable agricultural practices um, to both um, be better for the soil, but also improve their yield. Um, and we helped them get to better quality year round. We're now in year five. We're super happy with that collaboration. Yields have doubled for the farmers, which of course has a direct impact on their incomes. So they are well above living incomes now. We get better tomatoes, much more consistent quality year round. And as a result, the consumer gets a better product. So that's a good example, but I'm telling you, that's just tomatoes in India. I've got hundreds of more of these combinations um, and it's taken five years. So what's top of my mind for me, how do I accelerate this quickly to many more places, many more crops, many more countries with different coalitions because it requires collaboration. So that's what's top of mind for me, but it's absolutely critical to the planet that this gets done in many more places quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Porvi, maybe a couple of crisp comments from you. Have you seen examples in India of commercial sustainability, of economic sustainability? How was it accomplished? And then maybe uh, after you're done, I'd love to turn back to the first lady for some closing comments. Yeah, thanks, Tara. I think Hanika gave uh, one example already. Um, you know, there are there are a very large number of uh, of those kind of examples, but at the same time, there are also a very large number of examples where things have not worked down and it has not been economically sustained. So I think we need to learn from both of that, right? I mean, we have large examples like the dairy cooperative moment. Uh, two, we have um, uh, you know examples uh, from from smaller commodities also. But I think at the crux of any of these successful models, as Hanika said, number one is the collaboration and collaboration throughout the value chain, right? Only working with, say, for, for example, processing part will not work, only working with production part. Only. So collaboration throughout the value chains, pre-harvest and post-harvest is where we have seen a lot of success. Number two is aggregation, right? I said cooperatives. At smaller level, also, uh, you know, farmer producer organizations, basically, which is a, which is sort of an aggregation of 1,200, 1,500 farmers together, just giving them a larger economy of scale for them to make sense to the private sector. They uh, giving them better agencies and so forth. So I think uh, what is needed from those uh, those success stories, really, Tara, is uh, to use Hanika's word um, acceleration. Yes. 
yes, absolutely, uh, to tap into the potential, but at the same time also inclusion. Uh, you know, the opportunities are large. How do we create, uh, you know, platform for for more number of farmers, all sectors of farmer, landholder, landless, women farmer, men farmer, you know, how do we make that very inclusive? Uh, and also, how do we extend that to, uh, to more number of commodities, and not just very, very usual commercial commodities, um, including, say, for example, livestock sector, I think so, inclusion, acceleration, and uh, diversification would be the three key areas uh, uh, in, in this one. <laughs> Thank you. Turning back to the first lady, you've heard, I think, some great mm -hmm. examples of, of both private sector, of donor um, action. Um, <clears throat> as the host of the first hub, Food Innovation Hub, World Economic Forum Innovation Hub, maybe you can close out with some comments about what you'd like to see come to Colombia uh, and the changes that it can bring. Sure, I would like to add just a quick uh, thing to your first um, question and is just to leave you with three main um, actions and is that knowledge, which for me is absolutely connected to real facts, communication and collaboration are for me also an accelerator in, the, in terms of getting to that effect of, of productivity and, and efficient and effective ways to come to those uh, sustainable uh, food systems. Now, your question uh, towards how can innovation help somehow? I'm definitely convinced that innovation and technology has tremendous potential for the transformation. And um, as I said before, from agricultural production to market logistics to nutrition, Developing food systems that work for the people and, and the planet are essential. And uh, there's something that I do believe could be also an expedite solution is, and is uh, digital transformation and inclusive innovation are, are critical. We need not only to train on digital skills, uh, but we do need to train, especially the youth, if may I say, in how to use those skills, how to use the technology in solving traditional um, social problems. So of course there are challenges related to food systems and nutrition, and they cannot be addressed by any single actor. I will go once again towards a multi-sectoral approach and because uh, I'm convinced that, that we need even to, to get to innovation um, on that uh, co-responsible and, and cross-sector collaboration and, and iteration. So we've been working on this approach to innovation and, and foresee the opportunity of putting in motion um, what we call the lab. And is a model that consists of three components. I will probably just go through them very quickly, but basically is, is uh, to have this kind of laboratory of, of um, solutions in terms of, of all the different um, steps in the, in the sustainable sectors. And um, first, in, in that lab uh, perspective we, we have, we're thinking on strengthening the community practices. And this is uh, to have different actors, once again, commit to working towards collective goals, uh, all related to the system and, and to nutrition. And uh, this practice should include the national, the regional governments, the international cooperation agencies, the startups, which uh, lately in Colombia, we've seen many startups related to, to all the different steps of the ecosystem of nutrition. Then the second step will be a pipeline of projects. As I was mentioning before, I, I truly believe that once we have the route, we, we decided the target and we work uh, with the heart and with the commitment of coming up with solutions, uh, things can be done. And the third step would be the consolidation of knowledge 
and, and learnings as the two previous components move forward. So uh, this is a model that has been implemented in Colombia by our agency of innovation and entrepreneurship, which is called Impulsa. And we've been working together, uh, trying to, to leave this as um, some kind of, of root in the country, not as a government uh, project, but, uh, but as a state's commitment. Thank you so much. This um, uh, indeed has been quite a quite an informative panel. Thank you so much for my esteemed sort of all lady panel. Very proud to be moderating mm -hmm. you. Um, it brings us to a close on the first part of the panel. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing sort of not only your experiences, but your vision uh, for what the future can hold.